Galatians chapter number 5. Um, how many have trouble following when I'm, when I'm preaching, especially a message like this? Raise your hand if you're having problems following. One, everybody else is golden. The preacher's wife is all alone on that boat. All right, so here's what I've done. She's, she's told me she's had some hard times. So what I've done, I've put the whole series in book form. And uh, so if anybody wants one of those, it includes tonight. Do you want one of those? If so, raise your hand. Miss Samantha, will you give this to your mama? Uh, y'all raise your hand. I, I, I got five there. I can print off some more, but <clears throat> just give those to whoever wants them. Like I said, if you do want one of those, just let me know. Uh, I'm not selling them yet. Come on, so you get in on the bottom level. Come on. Anything I I sell uh, will come back back to me. All right, so we're going to start reading verse number 16. Galatians chapter number 5, verse number 16. I'm going to read the uh, these 10 or 11 verses. And uh, this will be the conclusion of the series. And um, I kind of joked on Sunday night about possibly doing a separate um, message to kind of bind it all together. But I don't think we'll do that. Uh, We'll just finish tonight with this. Make a couple closing statements about the very last part of verse number 23. And uh, and let that be it. But you found your place. Say amen for me real loud. So we see in verse number 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now, I want you to look at verse number 19 with me. We're going to read it, but just before I do, I want to call your attention to these next few verses because at the very close of the message, we'll, we'll refer back to those, okay? So, uh, up to this point, we've really not addressed the works of the flesh throughout this entire series, but we, we will quickly tonight in closing, okay? So, it says in verse number 19, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Verse 25, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Let's bow our heads again and pray, and we'll get into the message. Dear God in heaven, we thank you for this day. We pray now that you would speak to our hearts. Father, we realize, Lord, that your people that are gathered here today, they've worked, they've toiled. Lord, we pray that you'd give them a little rest from that. Uh, while we're here in your house, we pray that we might be able to preach your word this evening. I do ask you that you'd give us clarity of mind and speech. Father, we pray that you'd bring back to remembrance those things, Lord, that we've studied. Have your will in our hearts tonight. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we have now gotten to the end of this particular study about the fruit of the Spirit, uh, we know that now we're, we're on the ninth word, but this is part ten, okay, uh, including that introduction. Uh, but as we've come through all of these, we've, we've understood that each one of these have been a study about the gifts that's given to us 
by God through the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. Uh, they're evidenced in our lives. And this kind of hit me as I was putting this together. Um, we want to be super spiritual a lot of times. And, and we say things like, um, if you are saved, you're going to show at all times every single one of these particular um, um, uh, fruit, if you will. Uh, but what I've kind of come to their own realization myself is some come at once, uh, but then also some come uh, in due time. So there are some things that will evidence themselves at, at once, as soon as we're saved, and they'll be there all the time, every day, all day long. Uh, but then some of these things that we don't think about at a moment's notice, God gives us the power to exhibit these particular fruit, if you will. So in this lesson, and again, it will be the final lesson, uh, we understand that in temperance, uh, there is no different or no difference in its source or in its purpose. Again, it is from God and it is for God. Now, we get into this. I, I really, I've, I've tried to to uh, to maintain the same format in in the title, and and I've done um, just just for instance, um, we dealt with meekness last week, and then I've given you two words that kind of describe uh, the situation um, last week. Um, let's see what was it? unpopular and misunderstood. All right. Well, this week I completely forgot about doing that, but so I've just got temperance. But uh, if you need it, uh, if you need a fancy title, I'll I'll give you that later on. Okay. So I want us to look number one tonight about temperance explained. Temperance explained. Again, we've mentioned this before. If we were to look at at another version of the Bible, we would find that the the wording in many of these are completely different. Uh, but one that you'll find the most when it's referring to temperance, you'll find the, the two word, compound word, if you will, uh, which would be, um, self, somebody help me. You know what it would be? Self control. Uh, and so we'll deal with some of those things, but as, as we've looked into a lot of different books and you'll, you'll find those as I, as I go through, I've come to my own conclusion. I kind of defined it myself, a little outside the parameters of, of normalcy, and I've, I've defined it as strength to hold. Strength to hold oneself, if you will. We do need to remember that these traits are given to us by the Holy Spirit. And so, because of that, it's not a stretch to read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, verse number 9. It says, And he said unto me, this is Paul. Remember, Paul had dealt with that thorn in the flesh. He asked the Lord three times to remove it. And Jesus said, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And so if this is given to us, this temperance is given to us by God, and it means strength to hold on to oneself, then this strength comes from God as well. We just read there in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 that Christ gives us a strength in our times of weakness. When we, when we are not Temperate. When we do not exhibit temperance, God allows us through that Holy Ghost to have the strength to to control ourselves, if you will. Albert Barnes said it denotes or it exhibits the self rule which a man has over the evil propensities of his nature or uh, the things that he is prompt to do because of his nature. Uh, he said that it, it denotes the self-rule that, that stops that. That is what temperance does. It stops us from reacting, if you will. Um, Albert Barnes, he went on to say, uh, our word for temperance, that we use now, it often refers to alcohol or maybe drugs or something along those lines. But he says, our word temperance we use now in a much more limited sense, referring mainly to abstinence from intoxicating drinks. 
He said, but the word here is used, it is employed in a much more extended signification. And so what he means, as you, if you were to take this and you were to dig a little bit deeper into what he said, that it is not just intoxicating drinks, and that is actually nowhere in this particular text that we're reading in verse 22 and 23, but as a whole... Through the Holy Spirit, He gives us temperance to control those things that by nature we want to seek out. Uh, we see this, that it is a not only a strength to hold oneself, but a practiced mastery of self. In other words, you, you have mastered yourself. Paul said that he has uh, not attained, or as we often say, that he has not arrived as of yet. And neither have we. We've not come to that point in our life where we can say, I've arrived, I've accomplished everything that, that I set out to do, I can learn no nothing else, I've, I've got as much uh, knowledge as I can ever have. So none of us could ever get to that point. But what this word temperance is, is it is a practiced mastery of self. One writer said that it holds the reins of the chariot of life. In other words, it controls our actions. As we've looked through love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, and meekness, uh, those, uh, they often do revert, or not revert, but represent how that we should act towards God or towards others. Uh, but this one is, is more so a self-exhibited fruit than anything. Uh, how many of us, as we uh, struggle with different things in our lives, uh, we may not act on them, but immediately we react in our mind. We re- immediately begin to um, to get angry or to get hurt or uh, to struggle with a decision that was made. And all of that can be considered a lack of temperance, a lack of mastery of our own selves. He says it uh, holds the reins of the chariot of life. Paul said that he is a temperate man who holds himself well in hand who meets temptation as a disciplined army meets the shock of battle, by skill and alertness and tempered courage, baffling the forces that outnumber it. That's what temperance can do. I read a book that was dealing in part with a soldier in I believe it was the, I guess it would have been the Civil War. And it's Joshua Chamberlain. And Joshua Chamberlain, um, he was one of the last standing commanders. And he was given a choice, internal an internal choice, of whether or not he was going to lay down his arms and let the enemy advance, or if he was going to do something. And so instead of stopping and and allowing the enemy to advance, he fixed the bayonets and he began to charge and was victorious over that. Listen to this quote again. It says that Paul talks about this temperate man. It says that he is temperate if he holds himself well in hand. He is temperate if he meets temptation as a disciplined army meets the shock of battle. By skill and alertness and tempered courage, baffling the forces that outnumber it. In Joshua Chambers' own hand, he wrote his own story of how that he was able to be victorious over the the enemy. He was out of ammunition. He was out of time. He was out of this, that, and the other. But because that he forced himself and his companymen to go to battle with nothing but their bayonets, it baffled the enemy. And our temptation that I personally believe, there's a difference between testing and temptation, our temptation or the solicitation to do sin, okay, when we are tempted, that comes from Satan. Oftentimes that comes from ourselves as well. 
We put ourselves in such a predicament that now we have to make a choice whether to to fall into what the Bible says is the lusts of our flesh or to do something otherwise. Well, if we are temperate, Paul explains in multiple places, we'll get there in a minute, but Paul explains that if we are temperate, then when that temptation comes, we will likely do the thing that we ourselves don't expect to do. Because ourselves, we've mentioned it over and over again, we are nothing but humans. We are flesh and blown, uh, flesh and blood. We are, we are sinful by nature. And so when temptation comes, our nature wants to go back to that sin. But if we are temperate according to the scripture and we have mastered our own self, then in the face of temptation, we will baffle the temptation itself. Let's go on. It is the spirit which has mastered its desires and its love of pleasure. William Barclay said that the ancient Greek culture, they used this word temperance or being temperate uh, as a virtue of an emperor who never lets his private interests influence the government of his people. It is the virtue which makes, um, which makes a man so master of himself that he is fit to be a servant of others. When we master ourselves, when we become temperate, when we exhibit temperance, we are able not only to be victorious over our own selves, but at that point, we can be a servant to others. Because what, what will a, what, what must a servant do? Whether it's an employee or what? A servant must do the bidding of someone else. And so, if we can ever get to that point where we exhibit temperance, Then when we are told, when we are serving someone else and we are told to do something that is maybe against our nature or something that we don't want to do, we can. I want to go back to meekness. We we, we want to go back to that point, but we can be temperate and simply say, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I will do as I'm told to do, not react in such a way that would bring shame to God and to ourselves. It is also mentioned as self-control. Uh, in Matthew Henry said, in speaking of meat, I mentioned that temperance is often used as maybe against the intoxicating drink, but also in meat and fasting and things of that sort, as we read in Galatians. But he says, in speaking of the meat and drink and other enjoyments of life, temperance is not to be excessive and immoderate in the use of them. When we are temperate, then we are very carefully using the things that bring joy. I'll I'll just give you a a quick example, all right? Some of you may have a boat, all right? You enjoy your boat. You like getting out on your boat, all right? There's nothing wrong with having a boat. Somebody say amen right there. Nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with going out and spending some time on the boat with your family or your friends, all right? But what he is saying, what Matthew Henry is saying here is when it becomes excessive. All right. But then if let's just be real, we're in church. We're talking about church things. If you start missing church because you enjoy your boat so much and you're out on your boat instead of being in the house of God, it has become excessive and you're lacking temperance. It is not just the personal rule of mastery or mastery of one's activities, but it is the governing of the believer's spirit, the desires and the fleshly impulses. Temperance. I told told Jody or somebody yesterday, I said, man, this 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 idea of temperance, it's it's getting it's gonna get on everybody. It doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what it is, it's gonna get you because We are human, as I mentioned earlier. We are fleshly beings, and we have fleshly wants. That doesn't mean that they're bad things that we want. Don't misunderstand me. But temperance, listen, it can go from, as we've mentioned, to intoxicating drink. 
It could go to food. Uh oh. It can, uh oh. It can go to time. You know, we've got, we've got screen time on our, on our devices now. And that thing will, that thing will come up and say, hey, you've, you've been on your phone so many hours a day. And I'm thinking, there's no way. There's no way I've been on my phone that long. And then I get to thinking about all those times where I stop and I start scrolling through social media and I start looking at a video and that one ends and it goes to the next one, that one ends. And I've wasted 30 minutes at a time or even longer and those things add up. What those, what those have become, they've become excessive and I've not, I'm not ruling them well. Bob Sanders goes on, he says, it, uh, temperance is a mature state of steadfastness in which one is not easily affected by the world, by flesh, or by the devil. It is a state that is impossible to attain without control of the Holy Spirit. You've got these uh, these monks, and they'll go to some mountain, some, I don't even know what they call those things, and Whatever they're called, I don't know. They'll go to these places and they'll they'll be in solitary confinement. They don't talk to anybody and they take oaths of silence and they do all this and they, they and, and and I don't know anything about. It. I've never met a monk, so I couldn't tell you. But they go to those places and they're they're trying to to reach a plane of existence. And I can't speak to their hearts. I really can't. All I can speak is as a man. We cannot attain temperance. It is not inbred in us. It is a gift from the Holy Spirit. Not only does He give us that, but He strengthens us so that we can exhibit it. Let's go on. Number two. We saw first temperance explained. Now let's look at temperance employed. It's found, the, the word temperance is only found in, in three places in your Bible, but it's in there four times, okay? One is Acts chapter number 24, verse 25. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time when I have a convenient season I will call for thee. And we go to the temperance. Of course, it's mentioned here in our text. And then twice in Second Peter chapter number 4, I believe it's verse number 6. We'll find out when we get there. But verse number 4 says this, "...whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust." Verse 5, "...and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith..." Virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. So, we see that temperance employed, it's it's only three places in your Bible. But then, not only that, but we see that it is... It, the, the word is changed and we find the word temperate. And it is in your Bible several times, but there's two verses, uh, that uses the word temperate in a similar way as temperance. You'll find the word temperate multiple times, but it's often used in a different sense. In Titus chapter number 1, verse number 8, it says that, now this is one of those pastoral uh, um, epistles that Paul has written to a young preacher named Titus, and he has given some qualifications, and he says that, uh, that a pastor should be a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, or temperate. And here this word temperate is... A master of a thing. If you remember when we de- defined one of the three definitions of temperance was to master oneself. Okay? Then in Titus chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, 
temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. Now here, this word temperate, it means to be safe in mind. Safe in mind. Or you may have read it as sober. Sober. And so here in Titus, again, he is speaking about those those men, those godly men, they should be sound in mind. It sounds to me like uh, what James wrote about not being double-tongued and not being tossed about with every wind of doctrine. You need to have your mind fixed on the things of God. Now, number three, let's quickly look at temperance exhibited. Okay, so we're, we're putting the rubber to the road now. The, uh, and I believe Paul mentions this in 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter number 9. But the Christian, like the ancient athlete, exercises self-control in all respects. William Barclay said that this, this athlete, he ex, uh, exhibits, exhibits self-control in the discipline of his body. If you talk to many of uh, uh, many athletes um, and, and compare what you eat with what they eat, they may eat a lot more than you, but they eat oftentimes the right things, the right amounts of proteins, the right type of fats, the right amount of fats, and things like this. We just see a big a big buffet out there, and we just eat whatever we want to eat, and end up dying when we get home. But an athlete, they are eating not based on what their plate is going to look at. They are eating oftentimes on the way their body will react to what they've eating or what they're eating. It makes me think about this, what we consume throughout the day, spiritually speaking. How does our spiritual body react to that? There's a programming term in computers, garbage in, garbage out. It can be applied to anything in our lives. If all you do is just bring in garbage into your life, guess what's going to come out? Garbage. That can go from music. That can go from speech. That can go from reading your 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 books, your article, whatever it may be. Garbage in, garbage out. Now, I realize that not all of us can sit at the house and we can read our Bible all day, any day that we want to. And and let me just read a chapter. Let me read a book. Let me do this. Let me study. I understand that. But we ought to be reading the Word of God. We ought to be hiding it in our hearts. Because there is coming a day when you may not have that. Now, I'm not. this is not doomsday. I'm not talking about them ripping the Bible out of our hands and burning them. That's not what I'm talking about. There may come a time where where you cannot physically read your Bible. But if you've read it and you've applied it and you've hid it in your heart, it's there. There may come a time where you're just simply separated from your Bible. And someone needs a verse. Someone needs a word from the Lord. If we will get serious about what we are bringing into our lives, then guess what? When someone needs that word from God, that word may be able to come from us. So, temperance exhibited. I I told you, 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, verse number 25. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now, they do it. He's talking about these athletes. They do it to obtain a corruptible crown. But we do it. We strive for the mastery, not for a corruptible, but for an incorruptible. One writer said that it is, and I had to look this word up, it is the antithesis of drunkenness and revelings. It's it's the opposite, okay? It is the opposite of drunkenness and revelings. So, what, what are we dealing with tonight? We're dealing with temperance. Temperance is the opposite of drunkenness and revelings, which closed the list of the works of the flesh. Just as the preceding graces, he calls these fruits, this fruit of the Spirit, he calls them graces. From peace to meekness, 
are opposed to the multiplied forms of enmity and strife that we find in verse number 18 through 21. You can compare these, and, and I'll give you this list in just a moment. We can compare love, joy, peace, long suffering, and so on to those, uh, I believe it was 17 works of the flesh in verse 19, 20, and 21. It can be observed that the fruit of the Spirit are opposed to the works of the flesh. We understand that. That's not rocket science. That's why there's a difference. So love is opposed to hatred. Joy is opposed to emulations and envyings. Peace is opposed to or opposite of variance, strife, seditions. Long-suffering to gentleness, goodness, and meekness. Excuse me. Long suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness are opposite of wrath and murders. Faith is opposite of idolatry, witchcraft and heresies. And temperance is opposite to adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, drunkenness and revelings. Temperance is opposite of all that. There's a huge list there. What are those lists? Those are things that attack the flesh. Listen to that again. To adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, drunkenness, and revelings. Temperance is the guarded step, the sober, measured walk in which Christian goodness keeps the way of life and makes straight paths for the stumbling and straying feet. Temperance. I love... Temperance is the guarded step. I remember... Still deal with it a little bit, but when I got COVID, when we all had COVID... Uh, one thing that I dealt with for, for months afterwards, and, and I've still now, we're two years past it, was my balance. Could not walk a straight line, you know, foot in front of the other. I couldn't, couldn't tow the line, if you will. And a friend of mine invited me up to, to, um, North Georgia, close to Ringgold to go hunting. I'm like, yeah, I'll go. So I we went up there. And, uh, he said, now, he said, there's, there's, I got ten acres. And then it butts up to some public lands. I'm like, okay. So we went through through the woods, and and I, I could see it from a distance. There's a huge, huge ditch. I'm like, man, how are we going to get through this? We well, got up there, and Nick, there was a, a log across the 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 ditch. I was like, hmm. So I got my backpack, got my gun, I got all of me, and I'm looking at this thing, knowing. That, Brother Bobby, I can't hardly walk a straight line. And so, I don't know if y'all do this, but I kind of panic a little bit. There's a tree on this side and there's a tree on the other side standing up. And so I balanced myself on this side. Well, I scooted across that thing till I got close enough to reach that other one. Cause it, Brother David, it was deep. It's probably six feet deep and it's about that wide. But I needed a shore. I needed a guarded step. I wasn't, this, this may be out of line according to, to what we're preaching, but I wasn't looking at the tree that I was going to hold on to. I was watching my steps to make sure I wasn't off. Temperance is the guarded step or the sober measured walk in, in which Christian goodness keeps the way of life and makes straight paths for stumbling and straying feet. He is, Paul, is taking us into a sphere of Christian fellowship and Christian intercourse. The characteristics which he names here, all of these, love, joy, and peace, are those produced by the Spirit among Christian men and women in their social intercourse with each other, in their church fellowship and church life. 
As I read this, I kind of sat back in my chair and I, I began to think, the fruit of the Spirit is. And I realized that in the grand scheme of things, we need to be showing these things to everyone. But who is he talking to? He's talking to the church. He's talking to believers. So this writer, his name is Colross, he says that as Paul takes us on this journey, he basically is helping us in our social interactions with one another. I've said this, probably you've heard it, you've experienced it yourself. Some of the worst people to deal with in the public are church people. That's a crying shame, first. But that's out in the public. What's, what's even worse is that we are brothers in Christ. And so often we hurt one another with words, with actions, with, by ignoring, by shunning, or snubbing. Those are things that, that we should not be doing. We should have long suffering with those that have hurt us. But we should have love, and peace, and joy. Just go down the line towards one another. Towards us. Here at Lighthouse. This is what we should have. Christian character then is not an edifice. It's not just a, a facade, if you will. But it is a fruit. It is a fruit of the Spirit, not of effort or of law. I gave this quote to you at the very beginning of this study. That these fruit of the Spirit, it is vital, aggressive, militant, and triumphant. Warren Wearsby says, it is possible for the old nature to counterfeit some of the fruits, but the flesh can never produce the fruit of the Spirit. I've said that to you nearly every week. We can't, we can't do these things. You may find somebody that's absolutely full of love that has no relationship with Christ. You may find somebody that's at peace with everybody. You may find somebody that's so patient. They could be considered a saint. But even still, those are, those are counterfeit, if you will. They come from themselves, not from the Spirit. The last part of this verse, it says, against such there is no law. Against these nine things there is no law. I, I'm not going to waste any any more time other than saying this. Up to this point in history, in 2023, that I know of, there's no law against any of these things. But what I can tell you, we mentioned counterfeits. What I can tell you is that there have been many perversions of these things. One of those, I have to, I have to say this about love. We have love of God. Going back to our second lesson. We have that love. I gave you a list of different types. God instituted a certain type of love between men, mankind. He gave us brotherly love towards one another. But look how marriage has been perverted. Last week we dealt with meekness, and I, I told you explicitly that meekness is not weakness, but according to our society, if you are meek, if you are humble, then you are weak. So these things, they, they cannot be manufactured, but they have been perverted. And then, very last, The fruit of the Spirit, 
Uh, Again, this is part 10. So 10 Wednesday nights we've studied this. But I need you all to understand this. We, We have dealt with this study as I mentioned earlier. It's given to us, the, this fruit is given to us by God and for God. But do we realize tonight that each of these can be considered an attribute of God? So with that thought in mind, we could do an entirely different study and never repeat a thing that we've read tonight when we apply each of these about God. Think about how God loves us. Think about the peace that God gives us. Think about the joy that God gives us. That, that's wonderful. But think about the joy that is God. The peace that is God. These things are attributes of our Father in heaven. Not just gifts from Him. But the reason that He can give it to us Is because it is Him. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We have God the Father, we have God the Son, we know we have God the Spirit. Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, whatever. But as we look further and we go over to John, chapter, first John, chapter number three, chapter number four, or seven and eight, it says that God is love. We can find every single one of these in Scripture referencing back to God. So, with all of that said, this series is...